Greetings, friends. Town Manager Wilson Cooper here, broadcasting from historic Town Hall in beautiful downtown North Wilkesboro. Coming to you with the latest episode of The Keynote, the Town of North Wilkesboro's monthly podcast. I gotta confess, I've never felt as inadequate as I do today during the podcast. My guests today are all part of a team that's uh, working to create a technology-based economy here in North Wilkesboro, and I'm sitting here recording them on my little laptop with two little tiny mics. So, guests and listeners, I beg your pardon. We'll do our best today with our simple technology. It's kind of like we're blending old and new Wilkes County here. We're crowded around the mic like our neighbor musicians do, talking about digital economy. Uh, but before we get into that, an announcement. Congratulations to former North Wilkesboro Mayor Robert Johnson, who was recognized last week on his induction into the Order of the Longleaf Pine. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Order of the Longleaf Pine is an award handed out by North Carolina governors to folks who they deem worthy due to their service, accomplishments, or contributions to culture. So this is a great honor for former Mayor Johnson, but also for the town of North Wilkesboro itself. So congratulations to him. All right, let's shift to our main topic. You know, people of my generation I'm right on the edge between Generation and X and Millennial, who grew up in this state and, and honestly other states too, have lived our entire lives in a state of economic flux. Our state's evolution from a manufacturing and agricultural economy to something else has been going on our entire lives. Some areas like the Research Triangle Park and uh, the Charlotte region have arguably completed this evolution from the historical economy to the new, while other areas, mainly rural ones like us, are still experiencing the change. And on top of that, the pandemic has jump-started another phase of our state's economic evolution, where where you work is less important than it used to be. My guests today are part of an effort to try and respond to these two states of economic affairs by making North Wilkesboro and Wilkesboro a hub for the digital workforce in North Carolina. They are Zach Barraclo, Craig DeLucia from North Carolina Tech Paths, and Jason Shropshire and Shiloh Casey from Infusion Points. Welcome, friends. Great to be here. Thanks for having yeah, us. Thanks for having us. Craig and Zach, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Tell us about North Carolina Tech Paths and tell us why it is important. Hey, so I'm, I'm Zach uh, Barricklow. I, I serve uh, in two capacities here in the community. I serve as VP of Rural Innovation at Wilkes Community College, and I serve as Executive Director of uh, NC Tech Paths. And uh, so I've been with the college for about four and a half years now, uh, working on uh, different program innovations and improvements to uh, increase our graduation rate and, and student success. Uh, Craig DeLucia, I'm the CEO of the Leonard Herring Family Foundation and the president of NC Tech Paths. Um, this is really kind of the outgrowth of, of the strategic plan at Wilkes Community College to work on increasing uh, the number of our neighbors that can uh, have a really meaningful job in the jobs that exist today and the jobs that will uh, in the future. and and. I think we're coming at this at a, at a really critical time where companies are embracing the concept of a distributed workforce, especially in technology, talent that doesn't need to live where the company is located. Uh, and companies are looking to find the best talent they can regardless of location. That kind of brings us to now. Yeah, so I guess a, a, a summary then of the sort of concept behind this is that you know, community colleges have always existed to teach people trades, and traditionally that means carpentry and, and automotive technician uh, trades and so forth. But now a trade is technology-based, um, and so evolving the curriculum of a community college to be more uh, technology-based and more types of training. So, so Craig and Zach, you know, I know that you guys have gone around and given your speech a lot. We might have some listeners who just don't have any previous information about what North Carolina Text Paths is. So give us the 30-second elevator speech about what it is to someone who's totally unfamiliar with the program. 
Yeah, so, and just to kind of ground ourselves in, in the context here, we, we are fundamentally focused on elevating this region in an economic sense. So economic mobility is our aim, technology is our means, technology jobs is our means. So what NC Tech Paths is, it's a nonprofit that exists alongside educational institutions, alongside employer partners. And it's here to support and enhance that educational pipeline in a variety of ways, whether it's through scholarships and uh, internships uh, support, uh, whether it's through uh, field trips and um, you know, career exposure efforts, uh, it's supporting an educational pipeline. That's the first piece. The second piece is that it is uh, brokering and developing uh, connections and a network with employers in the region, outside of the region, really kind of over the long haul nationally in this environment of remote work and with the, uh, the compatibility between remote work and technology jobs. So that's, a, that's another big piece. And then the third big piece is once you have talent coming through an educational pipeline, that is connected to employers who need that talent, we are actually investing in infrastructure to give those folks a place to work. Our premise is that the work from home 100% of the time model is not necessarily uh, the ideal setup for both workers and employers. <clears throat> and we see in the future more of a hybrid and, and we see employers across the country embracing more of a hybrid. Uh, of work from home sometimes, but work as a team in a space uh, together. And so our infrastructure component is investing in facilities that are in our downtowns, in this beautiful part of the world, small downtowns that would benefit from professionals coming to those downtowns, working there, and also spending money in the local coffee shop and the restaurant and other things. Uh, and so. So the, the uh, infrastructural component is uh, one of the, the third piece of our puzzle. So talent connected to employers, given a space to work. And Zach, I, I kind of jump on the back end of that because the, the, the question I get most often is, well, wait, what do you mean technology talent? What are technology jobs? What, what does that mean? And I can't wait to hear y'all talk, uh, Jason and Shiloh talk about infusion points because cybersecurity is just one of the highest demand, highest growth professions in our country and in our state. And yet tech is, is you know really broad. It's broader than that. Every mid to large size company has a sizable amount of technology needs in their workforce. Um, it's not just quote unquote tech companies. So this isn't just about being a computer programmer or a software developer. That's a part of it. It's not just about being skilled in cybersecurity, but that's a part of it. It's across the board, the ability to fill technology jobs from right here in Wilkes County. You know, so Lowe's announced that they're hiring several thousand technology workers. Honeywell, you know, major, major company is hiring technology workers. That's in addition to Apple coming into our state, you know, down east and, and announcing they're going to hire over 3,000 people. Um, when you look across the board, right now there are 48,000 unfilled technology jobs in North Carolina. And when we started this, this really, pro when we started this project in depth a little over a year ago, that number, Zach, was what, about 26, 27,000, somewhere yeah, thereabouts? Yeah. And, and, and grown to 48, and the number just keeps growing. What's critical is that a sizable portion of those jobs don't require a two year or a four year college degree. Some do, and there are tremendous paths into technology uh, with that two year associate's degree or four year degree. But a lot of these programs, a lot of these, these fields of study can be filled with folks who can devote 12, 15, 18 weeks of intensive learning to gain the skills to go out and do network support, helping a company manage its networks uh, and its equipment. IT support, helping the individuals of a company manage their relationship with technology. And when you think about, you know, Wilson, what you were saying about the community college providing skills, our state's community college is, a, is literally a national leader 
in providing new skills to adult learners. We are recognized around the country as having one of the best community college systems across the 50 states with a strong reputation for these 12, 15, 18 week type, type programs. It just lines up so well with the needs in tech for us to dive in and move the needle. So listeners, uh, sorry about that ambient noise came through during their remarks there, but uh, that's just life in in downtown North Wilkesboro. Uh, so uh, we're here in my office, we're not in the studio, so uh, that just uh, comes with the territory, but uh, we'll try to make sure that everyone's heard even if there's outside noise coming in. But uh, Craig, uh, you mentioned uh, Jason and Shiloh and their company. Uh, Infusion Points, which is a partner in this effort, but frankly, let's be candid, also a beneficiary uh, because they're a growing company that's always looking for more talent and hopefully this will uh, expand the pool of candidates that uh, they can choose from in, in the future. So Shiloh and Jason, tell us a little bit about yourselves and about your company and why this effort is important to you all. Sure, Wilson, thank you. Um, so I'm Shiloh Casey. I'm the Director of Advisory Services with Infusion Points. Um, I work with a team who assists customers um, implement security um, and make sure they're securing their information. Infusion Points was started in Wilkes County about 15 years ago um, by our CEO. He had this great vision of having this cybersecurity firm in the mountains of North Carolina, and he has made it happen. Um, we've grown from, you know, just Gary, he brought on Jason, um, and now we have about 50 employees. Um, and they, for the most part, they are located in this area, in Wilkes County or the surrounding area. Um, but we do, have, we do have employees all over the country. But Infusion Points, our main focus is cybersecurity. Um, so we, we have a, a large part of our business is working with customers who might want to sell their product to a government agency and they have to go through a huge checklist of security requirements so that they can be certified in order to sell their product to the, the government. Um, their we, technology product. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, we, we have customers here in Wilkes County um, and we have customers all over the world. And I think it's pretty cool that we're in this small little area and we're making such a big impact, um, not on, only on the area, but on much larger companies. We have companies who have hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, so it's pretty cool that we're, we're working with customers like that um, and, and making that impact. Yeah, and uh, so I'm Jason Shropshire, Chief Operating Officer at Infusion Points, um, and we're really, really thrilled to be a, a tech launch partner with NC Tech Paths. Starting this company in Wilkes County has been, it's been quite a journey, and we, 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 we recognized very early on that we were going to have to work with the educational system in the area and we really sought doing that probably 10 years ago. I know that we spent a lot of time in middle schools and in high schools trying to generate interest in STEM fields and then um, gaining traction and excitement about technology uh, and about the space that we're in. And then, you know, we, we kind of moved on and worked with um, Wilkes County Schools, you know, more directly um, with the apprenticeship program. Um, developing internship programs and eventually with Wilson Community College. And I know we've gained some good traction there with the, the kind of degree programs that we feel uh, gives us a decent, you know, educated practitioner who's kind of ready for the basics of, of the job experience, you know, especially in the security operations business that we, you know, really run out of the, the, the town here in our headquarters facility. You know, that kind of work requires eyes on glass for you know, multiple monitors. This is stuff that you can't do it at, in a home office environment. So we know that we're gonna to have to have a talent pipeline of people that are in the area that can come to an office. Um, so that's, that's very critical. It's been a dream of Gary and, and, and mine um, to, to help uh, bootstrap a tech corridor in Western North Carolina in our area. And I don't mean Asheville, I mean Northwestern North Carolina. <laughs> Um, and, you know, from Winston to Boone, you know, and everywhere in between. And, you know, we, we've got a great partner here at App State as well, you know, that's providing really good candidates out of the MIS program, CompSci uh, program. So it's, um, you know, all of, all of those efforts have been great, but this is really exciting for us. I mean, this is, this is the most traction, you know, that we've seen and the best program to help us make that, that launch a reality. And then when you just kind of pepper in 
you know, change that we've gone through in the last two years with uh, the pandemic, you know, it's, it's forced us all to rethink things, you know, so our idea of that tech corridor might look a lot more like just having a lot of t tech savvy people who can work together in an area, right? Some for local businesses, some for remote businesses, like companies like ours, you know, Shiloh's team. I mean, how, how many of your folks are, you know, in Florida or, you know, um, we've hired that. nationally, you know, since the pandemic started, uh, just because we have to source that talent where we can find it. Um, so, you know, we're all playing in this kind of world turned upside down, but I think we have a, a tremendous opportunity here you know, to work together, um, to bring, to bring, you know, all these, all these folks together, um, to make, to make this happen. And so, yeah. And you know, I've always taken a why not us mentality. To Absolutely. Things, right. Our talent here can compete with talent anywhere around the state. And I say anywhere around the country and through some of the data we've gathered at the community college, we know that to be true. That that's not just someone with pride saying we can do this. Um, our nursing students that go on to App State for a four-year degree graduate at a higher rate than nursing students who did all four years at App. Our local talent in nursing performs better in graduation than the overall nursing student body at App. And it's actually true for our transfer students in general to, to App State. That's right. They graduate at or above the, the native freshman uh, rate, which, is a, which suggests there's a strong foundation uh, of educational uh, base there. I want to I want to give Infusion Points though so just to just to chime in here. I want to give Infusion Points kudos for really being ten years ahead of <laughs> what we're doing. Mm -hmm. They've been at this for quite some time, and it's a great example of a local company with a global footprint really being vested in their community and spending time out in those schools, cultivating that interest, cultivating those those career pathways and time and money into the talent around them and to, into their neighbors to open up that opportunity. And, and the fact that you, you went down to the middle school age through the high school and you're, you've been one of the leading companies in the state with uh, apprenticeship NC in our local high school and community college is uh, just a major testament to the ethos of infusion points. Um, so in a lot of ways, we're we're joining the dance with NC Tech Pass <laughs> and, uh, and and joining into that rhythm. Big smiles on the faces of Jason and Shiloh right now <laughs> after that shout out. So uh, I want to go back and ask the group uh, to talk a little bit more about the other partners that are involved. So we've named a few of them. You know, we know the community college, we know Infusion Points. Uh, Jason alluded to Appalachian State. I know that there's a a training firm called. Perscolis or Perscolis? Perscolis. Yeah. Perscolis, that's part of this. Uh, and of course, the uh, entire efforts um, being underwritten by uh, the Herring uh, Charitable Foundation. So, Craig and others, if you could talk a little bit more about any partners that I've missed and, and what role each of those partners is playing. Sure, maybe I'll kick us off and we can all kind of jump on the backs of that. Um, the Herring Family Foundation uh, here in, in Wilkes County. Uh, had, had helped fund the strategic plan of the college, as I mentioned, focused on, on increasing completion rates, uh, graduation rates, uh, and reducing major switching. Because I think one of the hidden secrets of the community college system and the population that, that, that it serves is that if a student comes into a career path at the community college and then changes their field of study, okay, the chances that they're gonna succeed in obtaining that full two year associate's degree go down. Because so many of our students receive Pell Grants, they've got three years to get to, get to, uh, to get that two year degree. So as the college did a tremendous job, I'll give a, I'll give a plug to Dr. Jeff Cox and Yolanda Wilson and, and the whole team at Wilkes Community College. The college has almost doubled its graduation rate over the last four years, which is drawing a tremendous amount of positive attention around the state for good reason. But then about two years ago, Zach and I started to look at the workforce. It's fantastic that we're now graduating uh, students at a higher rate, but what are the types of jobs that are available for people? And how do we participate in the jobs that are happening as opposed to jobs of, of prior decade? That led us to technology, and in, in a moment I'll never forget, Zach said to me in the fall of 2019, uh, I really think we should tap into technology jobs, remote work, 
there's something here that we can be a part of. And this was fall 2019. I said, Zach, you are absolutely crazy. What could ever happen in this world where companies would agree to let talent work remotely at scale? And then COVID hit and I picked up the phone and uh, Everybody. Yeah, <laughs> said, okay, never have I been more wrong. Let's get to work. Um, the Herring Family Foundation uh, has provided a $2 million grant uh, to get us started as we actively fundraise the sustainability of the program. But what that allowed us to do was bring in a national learning partner called Perscolis. So the community college has a truly tremendous associate's degree in information technology, IT. Um, we're working on partnerships into four-year institutions for students who want to continue. And the college does a, a good job and has historically done a good job with those shorter-term boot camps, 12, 15, 18 weeks. The challenge in IT, and y'all, Jason, Shiloh, know this way better than I do, is that technology changes so rapidly that those short-term boot camp courses have to constantly refresh the way they're delivering content to make sure they're staying current. So Perscolis, uh, founded in the Bronx, New York, but now programs coast to coast in America, has enrolled over 16,000 learners across the country, uh, graduated 85% of them, launching them into technology jobs at an average starting salary of around $42,000 a year. Uh, and with the ability to upskill and add additional certifications and designations from there. Um, Perscolis had opened a facility in Charlotte during the pandemic um, but in discussions with them, we showed them the talent that we have, uh, both in, in the students that could participate and the talent at the community college that could facilitate a partnership to bring these two programs together. And that opened up all kinds of new doors for us. So now we have a software development class uh, underway with Perscolis right now. Those learners are co-enrolled at the community college, so they get the benefit of what both institutions can bring them. Um, those who uh, graduate at the end of that course will have an industry-recognized credential in development, and then our next uh, boot camp uh, goes live when Zach June-ish May, excuse me. Um, so key partners there, both the Herring Family Foundation for their generous support and funding, uh, and Perscolis. Obviously, Wilkes Community College is a key partner uh, and, and has been, as with all things, so wonderful to work with. But then the partnerships bloom further than that. Uh, there's an organization out of Raleigh called My Future NC, which is our state's educational attainment collaborative, um, which is a phrase that basically means a state nonprofit that's trying to increase the number of adults who earn workforce relevant credentials. Uh, they've been a critical partner. Our state's economic development partnership has been a critical partner. The local Wilkes EDC, Leanne Nixon and Robin and their team have been a tremendous partner. And then our two uh, founding uh, technology uh, corporate employer partners are Infusion Points and also a company out of Winston-Salem called Inmar Intelligence. Um, and what we're really grateful for, for both of those companies, is that they've been true partners, uh, not just willing to talk about hiring the talent uh, that comes out of these programs, but helping us look at the curriculum, help us shape the professional development and how we prepare these learners, not just how to be technically ready for the job, but how to succeed in, in the workforce. Uh, they've made everything we do better, and that's what real partnership looks like. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, question for Jason and Shiloh. What kind of person would excel in your industry? What kind of talents do you need to have? What kind of aptitude do you need to have? You can go to Zach and Craig's program and get trained on the particulars of, of the job, but what do you need to come with in order to be successful in this field? Do you want to talk about advisory? Sure. Um, so in, in my area of infusion points and my team, of course you need technical skills, but that's not all you need and it's not really our main focus. Um, when I'm looking at candidates, I like to look for 
uh, people who have um, great communication skills, they have really great organization skills. Um, project management is always huge on our team. We always need people who understand um, how to run and manage a product, how to, I'm sorry, a project, um, how to engage with customers, um, and, and, and also how to um, break down really complex ideas and, and explain it to a customer so they understand. The, the people we work with aren't always security um, professionals, and they may be IT, but when you think of security, it, it's almost in opposition to information technology because it's information security. And informa information technology... There's a tension there. <laughs> it is, because mm -hmm. technology is all about making um, technology accessible, making it easy for, for users, right. but security is about making sure that that information is safe, and that's not always... The goals of information technology and information security aren't always the same. So we need people who can explain these concepts and and also look at a, a wide range of um, applications and tools and services and understand how it fits into the different security frameworks that we're trying to to meet. It's it's really a lot of assimilation of data from from numerous sources, right? And you have to be savvy enough and and have a good critical thinking mind um, to be able to digest that information uh, and then make it make it make sense, right? So a lot of it we're dealing with new technologies all the time. You don't really have the time to get the kind of depth that you need, right? So you have to stay at kind of a somewhat of a shallow level uh, and not be distracted by the minutia, but to be able to kind of analyze. Um, how requirements fit in, you know, to that new information, and then have the professionalism to kind of give, give that back to the customer, right, and help guide them through a process. That's kind of what advisory is all about. All right, let me take it down to one more level. So if you were, all right, uh, let me give a little context. A few weeks ago, I went to a career day at uh, one of the middle schools here in the county, and one of the questions that the students asked was, what classes, 7th and 8th, 6th, 7th, 8th grade, do I need to focus on to develop the skills for this field? So what classes in middle school and high school should youngsters looking to go in this field focus on? Well, I would say you, you definitely need the foundation. You know, you, you need to understand technology. You need to understand information systems. So, so you need that, that foundation. Um, like Jason said, you, it doesn't have to be extremely in depth, but you, you need that wide, broad overview. Um, we, we often, will hire people from an IT background. They may not know a lot about security, but they have that foundation so they can learn and they can you know, put those skills to use in information security. Um, so, and I, I know a lot of high schools and middle schools off, offer those you know, computer classes, and, um, but they, they also might need communications. You know, they, they might need to practice giving speeches because you're speaking to customers. Um, we have recent college grads who are talking to, you know, DOD, Our biggest customers. <laughs> DOD agencies are there. Or they're talking to huge customers from. Yeah, yeah we have a, an App State grad with us who has been with us for about seven or eight months, and he is on one of our most important projects as the lead project manager. And he's even taken over from our prime as more of the face of our team. Uh, we're a subcontractor, and the prime has instilled that much confidence in, in him. Awesome. Um, he went through the MIS program at App State, right, which is, I think, our favorite for, mm -hmm. like, your team. Um, and really a different skill set and, you know, what they're trying to hone in MIS is more of those business skills uh, than they are from, like, a CS standpoint, which is more just scientific and I need to code this thing and mm -hmm. make it work, right? And we need those skills, too. Um, you know, we have different aspects of what we do, um, but... The lion's share of the work that we do is advisory, and, and to me, it's it's a very well-rounded education. I don't think you can exclude any of those middle school classes, right? They're all <laughs> they're all equally important. But you know, if I were in the middle schools with you, one of the things I would have done is remind these students that the Wilkes Community College Education Promise Scholarship, right, ensures that community college tuition should not be a barrier for any of our neighbors. And if I stack together what we can do in the high schools, especially the high schools that offer Career and College Promise CCP courses and the community college and App State, okay? A student who starts thinking about this in middle school 
can start taking some high school courses that qualify for college credit when they're in high school, enough so that they can complete a two years associate's degree at the community college in 12 to 18 months or less, and then be on the app and into the workforce within three years of their high school graduation. So it's never too early to get started thinking about it. Part of what we want to do at NC Tech Paths is identify barriers that kind of keep students from being able to fulfill that and remove them out of the way so they can be on the path. Yeah. Zach, you had a comment. Yeah, just the, the, uh, Jason and Shiloh, the, those were just really great insights about the fusion of the technical and the, the kind of soft skills or professional skills that are needed to succeed in, in today's environment, rapidly changing environment. And that's really consistent with what we've seen in the area and across the state uh, in the community college system. One of the things that we've put in place is a partnership with Accenture. Uh, Accenture actually developed a skills to succeed curriculum that is really robust, but it's focused on infusing into our curriculum and our extracurricular these, these employability skills. So teamwork and communication and problem solving and cultural competency and conflict management, um, all of these things that, that really kind of layer on to whatever kind of technical degree you're doing and make you more valuable because the technical skills, what my takeaway from your statement earlier, Shiloh, is that the technical skills are sort of the starting point. That's the foundation. Mm -hmm. But layering on those other skills is really critical. And, and that's where the, the alignment between our employers and our educational systems is just so critical, which again, I want to give kudos back to Infusion Points that they're, they're making sure that they're communicating that to our educational partners uh, as opposed to uh, the community college or our K-12 system kind of kind of you know guessing and yeah. and trying to figure it out as they go it's, right. it takes the guesswork out of it when you talk with Jason and Shiloh and hear that directly well if I can take a, a moment or two of privilege and provide my own commentary you know one of the many reasons why I'm excited about this project and what it means for North Wilkesboro on top of what it's going to do to enhance our workforce and enhance our competitiveness as a place to for folks to come and live and work is it's a great example of um, an evolution that's been happening in my industry lately and that is that problems are just too doggone big to be solved by one agency these days even a government agency like a community college or a municipal government things are going to have to be solved by teams of partners these days um, and so here at the town we've been uh, trying to enhance for example the outdoor economy in conjunction with the health foundation uh, nonprofit yadkin greenway council and others because it's just too big to do on our own and so I've got an example of that. Uh, yeah, so I'm so proud of this because it's a great example of that. Uh, and even though the town's not an official partner, I'm going to be a great champion of it for those reasons. Jason, go ahead. Housing. Yeah. Housing in our area is a, a problem. I think that it's going to require that kind of multi-prong, you know, lots of partners working together to solve. That's right. You know, when you look at the research, and, and Zach and I are both very research-driven individuals. Uh, it's the heart that kind of leads us to want to help our neighbors, but it's the data that helps us decide where to intervene and, and what to focus on. Um, we've been blessed to, to partner with an organization called CORI, C-O-R-I, which is the Center on Rural Innovation. I promise I'm going to tie this into your comment. <laughs> CORI is a national organization of regional nonprofits, regional initiatives as cohorts to learn from each other. Because there's things that we can learn about what's worked in rural Maine, in rural New Hampshire. Uh, some of the, the research Zach did coming out of rural Iowa and New Mexico informed part of what we built here. But as we study all of these other rural communities, including some that have launched and reached some real success in invigoration, the big three always comes up. Housing, childcare, transportation. Okay. And it, it may be different factors in different communities, but those three are the big three. And you're right, it's gonna take partnerships to try to remove those, those barriers. 
And the, the, the first one on that list that isn't mentioned because we have it in abundance is internet. <laughs> so, that, that's right. That's the infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's one of those why not us comments, right? So, I mean, our listeners, your listeners, Wilson, may not know this, but this county has literally the strongest, most consistent fiber optic broadband connectivity in the state of North Carolina. And so while other communities are trying to figure out how to get connected at high speed to the internet, thanks to our, our rural co-ops and, and, mm -hmm. and, and the foresight of so many a decade ago, we have the strongest, most consistent fiber connectivity in the state. So that's an asset to be leveraged and utilized as part of what makes NC Tech Paths possible because the companies that we're talking to, not just in fusion points, but companies around the state, uh, realize that we have that strong internet connection and the talent to plug into them to serve their businesses' needs. It's part of also what I think makes NC Tech Paths and this initiative relevant to other communities across our state and around our, really across the country in rural areas, is that right now there's, there's a lot of uh, money going into building that broadband infrastructure which is mm -hmm. great, but on the, on the back end of that, the question is, how do you use it? How do you leverage it? How do you make the most of that infrastructure to lift up your region? And that's what part of what makes me excited about what we're doing here is, I hope it becomes a playbook for other rural communities yeah. to tap into that, that digital economy. All right, so I'd like to go back to something, Zach, that you alluded to earlier, and I'll give a little context to this, and that is some of the stuff that we do here at the town isn't visible. <laughs> so, for example, we'll spend big bucks making sure that the water pipes work, but you never see that. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and so people will sometimes criticize us and say, well, what have you been doing with my tax dollars? And I'll say, well, we just fixed this giant pipe and then we buried it right yeah. so, yeah, so, yeah. and you know you'll know it's working when you turn your water on yeah. uh, and you know it's kind of the same thing with this a lot of the stuff that you hope to accomplish will be visible to Jason and Chilo and will be visible to you know folks in the industry but it'll be hard to see if you're you know a lay person uh, except for one thing that you mentioned earlier and that is the prospect of uh, some sort of physical hub here in downtown North Wilkesboro and you know professionals coming in and out and patronizing shops and restaurants and so forth so uh, talk a little bit more about that because I think that's something that North Wilkesboro residents are going to be interested in. Absolutely so you know Zach mentioned earlier you know this whole concept of what is work going forward especially now that all of us had a forced experiment to work from home for the better part of two years <laughs> but you know if we're honest with ourselves that enabled some things to flourish, but some things suffered, right? Whether it's physical health, mental health, collaboration, teamwork, uh, what we hear from companies right now, uh, 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 not speaking specifically to infusion points, but how sticky are their employee relationships in an era where an employee can work from home and be recruited by any company anywhere around the globe, and how do companies develop that stickiness with employees? So part of the premise, Wilson, that we, that we developed is I believe the future of work is distributed and decentralized. Talent doesn't have to live where the company has its main office. And just to uh, interject there real quick, just for a data point, 94% of technology jobs since 2010 were created in metro areas. Mm. So for the last 12 years, it's all been concentrated around those metro areas, and there's a short list of cities who have benefited from this more right. than anything. That's right. And, and, and so, talent wants to live here. How could you look out the window of this office and not want to live here, right? But comp talent has typically had to relocate where the company is. So we believe the future of work is decentralized and distributed, but we don't believe it's home work, you know, work from home five days a week. Talent needs to be together to inspire and collaborate with each other to develop that relationship with their company to truly work as a team. So we uh, are, are in the process of launching our first of several buildings, which we, we call Remote Tech Outposts or RTOs. 
Picture a, a co-working space if you've ever seen one. I know you have. You know, a co-working space brings together freelancers, employees, entrepreneurs into a physical building, gives them a place to work in an environment where kind of collaboration and, and being around other humans can happen. Our concept takes and includes that traditional co-working space, but then expands it out. Within our co-working spaces, we will have pods, areas that are dedicated to specific employers where that company can locate teams of 12, 24, 36 talented team members and grow that decentralized workforce. Our real estate in this beautiful downtown can be a physical outpost for our employer partners around the state and around the country. And that piece of our plan it's resonated not only locally because we'll be increasing downtown foot traffic, people that can buy a cup of coffee or, or shop at a store or buy something at a bakery, um, but it, it really helps make what we're doing, as you said, Wilson, visible to the whole community. So uh, we're under contract on our first building. Uh, it closes in a couple of weeks pending inspections and all those good things that always go into real estate. We got some upfit to do, but I really believe it's the first of several physical buildings that we will operate in the Wilkes Community College service area, so Wilkes, Ash, and Allegheny counties. Cool. Uh, yeah, I got to say that uh, I think that, you know, people hear the other things about workforce development and they know that it's good, but that's kind of esoteric, you know, they want to they want to see something, you know, we want to have a ribbon cutting somewhere. And yeah. So, so we're looking forward to that. Well, I'll tell you, Wilson, I will tell you, our first building will, will have space for about 80 individuals. Uh, and my goal is to have 40 of those seats filled by Christmas. Uh, that'll be 40 more sets of feet walking around downtown North Wilkesboro by the holiday season when folks are, are doing their holiday shopping. That, that's our goal. So have me back on uh, after Thanksgiving and, and okay. I'll tell you how we're doing on it. You all heard it. That's his goal. <laughs> He's laid down the marker. I have, and I don't say anything I can't deliver because I know no, okay. community's going to hold me to right. it. So. Okay. Fair enough. All right, so uh, I want to ask a question to the group that wasn't on the list. So just a little behind the scenes for our listeners. You know, I want uh, my guests to sound smart, and so I usually give them the questions beforehand so that they can <laughs> ponder and, and give smart answers. But uh, sometimes I like to throw a curveball at them and get an authentic answer, and so I'm about to do that. All right, so the question that wasn't on the list that I'm curious about that I'd like to know uh, an answer to is once your uh, seed money, your foundation uh, contribution runs out, how do you keep this program going? What's the sort of business model to make it sustainable? Sure. Yeah. S sustainability is, yeah. is critical. Yeah. Um, when we talk about having employer partnerships in this era where there's such fierce competition for talent, uh, part of our business model is to recoup a training and development fee from companies for every individual that we successfully place in a job with them. So what we've told Infusion Points and Inmar and some other companies that we hope are next to sign on the dotted line is we're not asking you for your corporate charity. We're asking you to participate in this program, help us develop the curriculum, and then pay us a training and placement fee for the talent that, that you decide to hire. And just, just to make sure, Jason and Shiloh, that's a pretty common in the industry, right? That's not some sort of pioneering approach to, oh, no. to business, okay. It's pretty common in recruiting fees and things, yeah. Okay. So, you know, our long-term sustainability model as a nonprofit is built on a couple of, of funding pillars. It's that earned revenue uh, for, for doing the job well, of helping people be workforce ready and ready to succeed. Um, I'll throw a quick kudo out there to Perscolis. Part of what gave us a lot of comfort in partnering with them is that their employer contacts come back and back again and again, year after year, to hire more talent, which tells me that that quality is there. So that earned revenue is a piece of it. A second piece of it is the profits from the co-working space and the physical hub. As we lease that space out to both traditional co-workers and companies, the profits will be reinvested back into NC Tech Pads. A third piece of it, just to interject, a third piece of it is uh, we actually have folks on staff that will serve as adjunct instructors. 
uh, for some of the components of instruction at the college and through the college programs. We don't want to replace or replicate or duplicate or compete in any way with our educational partners because they do what they do really well. Um, but we do have some specialized talent that will uh, supplement the instruction. And so that, that comes with a, a basic kind of instructional fee that comes back into NC Tech Pass to sustain those positions. That's right. And then we've got a robust grant writing process about to get underway uh, that brings us to the point of sustainability. Uh, as we get up that kind of startup curve and until we get the numbers uh, on, on, the, on the training and development side, there's a number of grant opportunities out there at a federal, state, and private level that'll help us stabilize the budget and get us to where we need to be. So just like any, any social enterprise or, or nonprofit or company for that matter, you're looking to kind of diversify your revenue streams to, to create stability and sustainability. And this is a braided uh, funding strategy for sure, uh, cutting across all of those. It, it's funny because Zach and I each built uh, a startup company from the ground up. Zach's was actually in a technology enabled space. Mine wasn't, it was in professional services coming out of my career in accounting. But we've each kind of been through that process of starting a business. Now, we're, I feel like we're doing it again. We're starting a business together. It's just that this one is a nonprofit. This mm -hmm. one is to serve the community. And, and Wilson, to your point, what we want to do in Program 4 goes to middle school field trips and elementary school STEM experiences, hands-on ability for the entire community to interact with technology and develop the lifelong skills to have a healthy relationship with what it means. Um, it's, it's a big mission that, that ultimately goes a lot farther than just the workforce piece. All right, Jason and Shiloh, what's next for Infusion Points with regard to North Carolina Tech Paths, but what's next for Infusion Points just in general? Can I jump in before, I'm gonna just be so rude and jump in before y'all even get to answer that question. <laughs> like, I wanna just celebrate for a second how amazing it is that we have this, this, this local company started by an entrepreneur who said, I want to locate my company here, right? He hires Jason. Together, they build now a 50 or so person team. And I genuinely believe y'all are going to double off of that given what's, what's ahead of you, right? So if all we were talking about at NC Tech Paths was saying, wow, Infusion Points is an amazing local success story of an entrepreneur who wanted to be in this community. How do we help them grow? Right, Just that alone would be something to celebrate. So it's really, really special. And I just want to say congratulations to y'all and to Gary and to everyone on your team because sure. it's really thrilling what you guys are building. It really, really is. You're here. No yeah. doubt about it. Thanks so much for the kind words. I mean, it, it, it has been a labor of love to some degree, um, for sure. And, uh, you know, I have to admit, you know, when, when, uh, when Gary first said, hey, we're gonna locate all security operations out of North Wilkesboro, and I've, I've got this building in mind, come take a look at it. Uh, I walked through the old Hayes printing building and it was in a pretty pretty dilapidated state. And yeah, that yeah, was one of the just, worst days. Let me just give some color commentary here. <laughs> <laughs> He's not kidding. <laughs> Have you they, seen the pictures, Wilson? I've, I saw it in, in the middle of the renovation and I guess towards the end of the renovation, <laughs> but even, it's even post renovation, it's not a flashy building. I mean, it's kind of a, an anonymous building, and I suppose that's what you want for tech security. But we try to fl you, we, we fly low. That's right. <laughs> they fly under the radar. You, you probably, if you've come into North Wilkesboro via 268, you've probably driven by it and not even noticed. It belies how successful they are being because, as as Craig said, they are growing. They are doing well. They are in my opinion, the sort of standard bearer of the new Wilkes County economy. Uh, and I try to hold them up and promote them whenever I have a forum to. But their building's not fancy. That's just <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, moving past that and to where we are today, you know, I would say we spent, gosh, the last, you know, 12 years trying to figure out what we wanted to be. And we really, um, I think, have, have found that. We found it about two years ago uh, when we we started pivoting into this cloud space that we're in um, and then helping commercial companies do federal work, right, with that cloud spin. We partnered with AWS, who's been a fantastic partner and given us the kind of leads that we used to dream about. Um, and, you know, we've, we've found a model now that we can scale. So, you know, 
hitting across all of our service lines, advisory, the managed security services, now to managed cloud, right, is really our future. Managed services is our future. So, um, you know, we are um, investing a lot. We've pretty much been investing profits every year uh, into, um, into building up what those offerings look like, bringing on the right people to be in those roles, uh, and then building the teams that can do that. And we have all the pieces in place. Now it's just a matter of scaling that up. Um, capturing these business opportunities and, and executing and, and scaling. That's what's next. Scalability. Good. Good. All right. So we've heard about NC Tech Paths work so far. They've built their partnership. They've got their seed funding. They're about to close on a building and start the remote tech outpost and figure out a way to or, or execute their long-term business plan. And I gotta say, y'all have come out the gates hot, and you've accomplished some things that I wish the town could have accomplished. For example, Zach just sent me today the article in Business North Carolina. Can I tell you how long I've been trying to get North Wilkesboro in Business <laughs> North Carolina? Because that's a publication that's read by every business person of consequence, not only in the state, but probably the region. It was special to wake up that morning and, and wake up this morning and read that article. So even though it was featuring you all instead of North Wilkesboro in general, I'll take it because it's a good <laughs> press for it. Uh, so you've already accomplished some big things. So what's what's next for North Carolina Tech Pads effort? Yeah, I think one of the things is kind of goes back to Jason's earlier point that you, we really can't accomplish everything we want to accomplish alone. It really requires partnership and uh, assembling that partnership in a really intentional way. And so one of the one of the the, the uh, I guess uh, approaches or strategies that that we are adopting is an ecosystem building strategy uh, not just this is the service we provide hope somebody shows up but really building the whole community around this the whole ecosystem around this which infusion points has been uh, really trying to build for m many years a decade mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the community and and now we get to be their partner in that process and so uh, concretely, one of the things that we're going to do to build that ecosystem is map it out. We're going to work with the Center on Rural Innovation between May and September. We'll enter into a cohort of communities across the country that are leading the charge for rural America in this space. And Infusion Points will be at the table. NC Tech Paths uh, will obviously be kind of guiding the process along with Corey, and we'll have a lot of different partners coming to the table, whether it's the K-12, uh, schools, NC Works, our High Country Council of Governments, WIOA partners, um, <clears throat> our, our other employer partners within and outside of the region, uh, etc. And, and so that ecosystem mapping is one of the next big things on the horizon for us to really have a handle on what the gaps are and what the assets are and where we need to invest very strategically and intentionally. Um, so that's that's one of the, the big things on, on the horizon, besides the list of things you already <laughs> you All right, So you said you wanted authentic answers. Yeah. So I'm going to give you my authentic answer and hope that my executive director, Zach, over here doesn't, doesn't smack me for it. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you what's on the horizon for us. Uh, there are so many amazing things happening. I genuinely believe that our ability to place talent into high-wage career paths is limited only by the supply of people that we reach who are interested in doing so and able to put the time into it. It really is. Our employer partners across the board have told us we will take as much talent as you can generate for us because we're having such a hard time finding it to begin with. So the, the challenge isn't the demand side, it's navigating the supply side. With Perscolis in particular, over the next 12 calendar months, we will probably offer three or four 15 to 18 week boot camps that don't require a two year degree as a prerequisite. Okay? And each of those cohorts has 24 seats. So if we do four in the next 12 months in entry level IT support, entry level network management, or pick your topic, right? That's 96 seats in the classroom by which an individual in 15 to 18 weeks can get an industry recognized credential, a professional development skills wrapper around the outside of it, 
and preferred interviews with corporate partners. And then from there, it's up to them to land the job, but we can get them to the door and to the interview standpoint. I want to fill those 96 seats. What's most important to me right now is reaching out through the community and asking everyone we come into contact with, who do you know? Who do you know that could benefit from this program? We all have friends and neighbors that, you know, they or their child or their cousin or whomever went on to four year and found four year wasn't for them and they moved back home. Well, what are they doing? Folks who started at the community college and life happened because that happens to community college students. Life happens and the journey gets interrupted. How do we find those people? I've got a year to get 96 great candidates into a program that can change their life and help provide for a family. And to me, that's the most critical what comes next step, filling that talent pipeline. Craig, if we have some listeners who are interested in participating, how do they apply? Come to nctechpaths.org. Contact us. Uh, you can contact me directly. I'm Craig at. Uh, Zach is Zach at. Or there's links in the website. There's LinkedIn. There's Facebook. There's social media. Uh, thanks to our amazing team member, Kate Vermilia, who runs all of our digital platforms. Couldn't do anything without Kate. Um, we will help get you to the right place. Because our goal, and, I, and, and Zach teases that I say hello in paragraphs, so I'm sorry that I'm going on <laughs> a pretty long duration here. We want to have a career path that can literally meet each learner where they are, from 12 to 15 weeks up to a master's degree at App State and everything in between. So if you want to come through the intake process and talk to us at NC Tech Paths, we can help you evaluate all of those options, whether it's boot camp, community college, app, or four year, and help get you on the right path. And shoot us a note, and we'd be glad to do so. Okay, good news. <laughs> all right, let's go around the table. I'm gonna give everyone 10 seconds for a closing statement. Let's start with Jason. 10 seconds isn't long enough. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanna point out that th there's gonna be by some estimates, 500,000 unfilled cybersecurity jobs in the country in 2022 and, and, and beyond. Uh, and that, that trend has continually gotten worse since I've been in the field. There just aren't enough, you know, the demand is there, As just to echo what Craig is saying. Um, so how can, we, how can we help backstop and backfill um, and train people up for those future roles is, is really what we're what we're after here. Um, and, and I also want to take my next 10 seconds um, <laughs> and just emphasize that this is not just a regional problem, right? This is a national problem and it's a national security problem because we have adversaries out there that are investing heavily in training the cybersecurity workforce and training the next generation of cyber warriors. I mean, some are saying that this is going to be the nature of warfare in the future. Um, so it's it's all I think I think we all have to do our part in the region that we're in, you know, to train train up the people for these these positions. Can I go next? I want to sure. go on that point and, <laughs> and just say if if there are folks listening who are talking to uh, to young people, talking to people considering a, a career change, the thing that I would say is consider the multiple angles of interest uh, for getting into cybersecurity. So. If you're a patriot and, and you want to protect our country, this is a great career path. If you like helping people and you like protecting people, we have nursing students who they just want to help. Mm -hmm. This is a great field to be able to help people and protect people. If you enjoy dynamic environment and working with a great team and you want to be in that, that fast paced environment, that's another reason to go into this field. So the motivation, if you want to earn a good income, that would be a motivation to get in. So there's a variety of, of kind of interest areas uh, where I think this this uh, this suits an individual, and and it's it's not just uh, an individual who has always loved technology, right? There's a variety of things around us that uh, are engaging and interesting and fun and exciting, and uh, and it's it's a phenomenal opportunity. So I hope to to echo both Jason and and uh, Craig. I hope the folks listening can help us get that word out. Craig, 10 seconds, and I mean it, 10 seconds. Uh, I'm filled with gratitude for our partners and for our executive director and, and for the town and the county. Uh, I'm, I think this is the most meaningful work besides raising a family that I've done in my life. 
Uh, and if, if you're a parent listening, wondering if this is for your child or your niece or your nephew or your neighbor or for you, one of the most frequent questions we get is, well, can, 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 can I really do it? Can I do this? Is this available to me? The answer is yes. The file is full, full of case studies of people with amazing skills that they didn't realize would, that would translate into technology that do. Come see us. We'd love to help get you on the path. Shiloh, you get the last word. Great. Um, and to build on what Craig said, th this field is for everyone. There is no one who can't do some part of this work. Um, it takes all sorts of people, all sorts of skills. And I know we have that, that talent here. We just have to develop. And I think it's super exciting that NC Tech Pass is doing this for us. Great conversation. Folks, I'm so happy and proud of you. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing for us here in North Wilkesboro. This is a great conversation and this is a really promising project. So for our listeners, let me summarize what I heard today. If you're a person looking for a career in tech, maybe, maybe North Wilkesboro is for you. Small town living, affordable, access to outdoor recreation, and plenty of career opportunities. And if you don't want to deal with the expense and crowds of the big city, Sounds like North Wilkesboro is the place for you. All right, listeners, for next month, I'm trying to get two of the players in the other promising economic development matter that's percolating in Wilkes County right now on the podcast. So tune in then. Until then, this is Wilson Hooper signing off. Take care.